Welcome everybody to the University of Toledo's College of Natural Science and Mathematics research webinar. So we're looking tonight at some specific research being done here at the University of Toledo and the opportunities and the access that our undergraduate students have to be active members of that research community. My name is Ryan Chernick. I am from the Office of Undergraduate Admissions. So I will be facilitating tonight, helping with questions and just sort of walking us through. But you're not here to listen to me. You're here to listen to some of the folks from our great science community on campus. And we're starting off tonight with one of our faculty in the biology department, and it is Dr. Heather Conti. So Dr. Conti, if you'd like to take over, please feel free. Great. Thank you, Ryan. I'm really glad to be here, and I'm, I'm so glad to see so many participants. I'm really excited. I hope at this point we're going to see you all in the fall, and if you are a <coughs> student, please, please reach out to me uh, if you have any questions, not, not just about research, but you know, even just settling into the department. You know, it can be a scary thing, and we're still you know, going through some stuff um, in the world. Um, so if you ha need anything anytime, um, please reach out. And you've seen my face a couple times. So hopefully we'll, we'll be able to recognize, um, or at least you'll be able to recognize me in the hall and, and um, introduce yourself. Um, I, I would really love it. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Hopefully. All right, everyone can see that. Yep. Okay, great. Um, so as, as Ryan said, I'm Heather Conti. I'm an associate professor in biological sciences, and I'm also the director of undergraduate research experiences for biological sciences. So I can't speak to any of the other departments in our college, but if you are a bio student, um, please, again, if you have general questions, not just about my research, um, reach out. Um, I have with me um, two of my students, two bio students that happen to be in the Conti lab. So I will spend a little bit of time talking in general about the bio department. And I apologize if you attended my talk previously, but you'll hear a, a little bit again, um, but hopefully it's a good thing to hear it, hear it a second time and then talk about my lab and the research we do in particular. So I have two of my students. Um, they're both honor students, um, Lana and, and Andrea, um, and hopefully they'll help us at the end um, with any of the questions you have and, and what they um, like about the research in our department and in our lab in particular. All right. So in the Department of Biological Sciences, and I think across the college, research is one of our key missions. And I think we're all really devoted, and not just devoted, but, but genuinely interested in working with undergrads. Um, we, we have, all of us have undergrads in our lab, and it's a really vital part of how we get research done here. Um, as it relates to you, though, uh, hopefully, once you get here and you start starting in your classes and start learning more about the research that goes on, you understand, you know, you might have heard, oh, get, get involved in research, right? It's good for your resume. And, and my hope is that you get beyond that and you, you really learn to love research and really understand that a hands-on authentic research experience really is the best way to learn science. You're all here, so I don't have to tell you um, that you're doing the right thing. You're learning about research early. Um, so start looking at the website, um, learning about all of our research, reach out to me. As I said, check out the faculty's research. Um, you can do that. And I know um, Gail will, will share these links with you. Um, you can do that um, on our website, go to research, and you'll see a list of everyone in our department and, and the research um, that they do. You can click on it. It'll give a little blurb, um, it, usually in, in terms that are a little bit easier to understand about what we do. So if you find your way to my research page, um, you'll, you'll learn a little bit about what we do, um, some of our publications, a couple people that are in the lab. Um, and I'm just going to talk 
generally about research in the Conti lab. And hopefully some of the things I touch on will kind of lead you in the right direction. You can start a list. These are the questions I'm going to ask any of the faculty that I'm interested in research and things to, to think about, um, ask. Um, you know, our lab is a big lab. That might not be right for you. Maybe you're going to want to find a small lab. So different things you can um, think about. I do want to, to mention, as I did the last time, right, this semester is obviously very different. Um, we, we can't have 10 undergrads in the lab at, at any given time. We're, I think we're doing a little bit better. Um, we have a few more in the lab. We're socially distancing, um, but it's still very different this semester. And I'm hoping that in the fall, it'll be closer to, to normal, or at least that new normal. Also want to mention that all labs are different. So at this point, I'm, I'm really speaking just for the Conti lab. Um, and that's good, right? You'll, you'll have a variety of research topics, but also faculty and, and kind of their, um, the way they run their lab. But, but right, this is, this is the Conti lab we're talking about. Um, so in our lab, we, me, I'm the principal investigator, I'm the PI, um, and then we have a postdoc, we have three current um, graduate students, two PhD, and then I do have one bioinformatics student. So if you're interested in that, that's also a question that you can ask. Um, and then I have usually about 10 undergrads in the lab. Right now, as we're ramping back, probably have five or so that are active in the lab. Um, and not all of them are honors. So you don't have to be an honors student to do research in our department. I think that's really important for you to, to know as well. We study the immune response to fungal infection, and I'll go into a little bit, of, little bit more detail. Hopefully you have questions about that though. But we study a disease that is common in patients with immune defects. So when their immune system isn't working properly. So what we study is highly relevant to human health. That might not be your thing and great. Um, even within our bio department, we have some great plant biologists um, that you can check out and um, some other um, labs that don't necessarily have to do with um, a, a human disease. Um, if you enter my lab, there's usually, I mean, there's some variation, but there's usually a timeline, you know, what you do, um, starting to, to finish. Usually you'll start off as a volunteer, you'll learn some common lab duties, you'll work um, kind of broadly across the lab, you'll learn from a lot of people, and then as we start to understand what you're interested in and, and you start to understand what you're interested in, you'll start to work directly with a, a graduate student, helping them with their project. You'll work your way to conducting experiments independently, um, if, especially if you're an honors student, but even if you're a student that starts, you're not honors and you start as a freshman and you, you work with us for an extended period of time, you'll hopefully start to work on your own research project in the, the process of that, you, and I think our department, we really tried to, to offer these opportunities to students um, to present your findings at meetings and conferences. Even this semester, it's remote, but we're sending a few students um, to um, a, a national undergraduate research conference. Um, I have in my lab, and I, this is pretty standard for just about any lab, um, undergrads are standardly included on publications. A current um, pub that we're trying to get out right now has three of my undergrads um, included. And then if you are honors, you're going to eventually complete your honors thesis and then hopefully move on to the next step, better prepared and, you know, it's okay to say more marketable. Um, so whether that be employment or professional school, um, and I, I do want to give a, a little shout out um, in, in that regard. I, I kind of did a quick look at, at the list of my students and there were 16 or so that were they're interested in professional school. And, and of those 16, um, 10 
got into medical or dental school to actually receive major tuition scholarships. And I can tell you that it was because what really set them apart was their research experience and the fact that they were on a publication. And then, oh, my, my little bar's in the way. And then four students that entered um, PhD or master's programs. You can also do research for credit. So that's something to at least start to think about. You can, um, take research, independent research um, for biology 4910. And even if you're not quite ready for that, you're not quite ready to do research in a, a specific lab. We have some really great um, research project labs um, as a class and it, um, two of our faculty teach that and it's related to their research, but it's, um, you just can't fit research into your life. It's a really great option because you you really you, you'll receive an authentic research experience there as well. And then lastly, you can get paid to do research. The Office of Undergraduate Research, which is a university-wide office, does offer competitive summer fellowships um, and I think just about every, especially honor student um, that's in my lab has, has received one of those um, to, to, to do research over the summer. Oops, maybe, there we go. Okay, so we are interested in oral mucosal immune responses or how our body in the oral cavity fights disease. And as I mentioned, the main infection we are interested in, in are fungal infections, and in particular, those caused by um, the, the fungus um, Candida albicans. And that the disease it causes is called oral candidiasis. Well, the thing about Candida albicans is that most of us um, probably have it in our oral cavity or, or on our skin. So, we're all healthy, right? It's not causing disease. If you've ever seen in a baby, the white patches on their tongue, that's thrush, that's oral candidiasis. So that infection is happening in the background of some sort of immunosuppression or some breakdown in how our body fights disease, fights infection. And that includes the infants and the elderly also HIV positive patients, um, the disease oral candidiasis is actually a, an HIV defining disease. Um, but also if you've ever been on antibiotics, right, get rid of, of, of the good bacteria and, and that can tip the scale and, and you can develop fungal infections. You can get oral candidiasis, but also importantly, patient, cancer patients that are receiving radiotherapy or chemotherapy, their immune system is immunosuppressed and they can also develop severe cases of oral candidiasis. So if we consider that last, um, that last group of patients, the, the cancer patients receiving these treatments, then all of this is also happening in the background of a malignancy in this case, uh, an oral um, cancer or a head and neck cancer. And what we see is if you consider this triad that they're all connected. And, and even if you consider the malignancy and the link to, to fungal infection, if candida albicans is present, present um, there is an increased um, risk for, for the development of oral cancers. So we really need to understand each of these points. And because we're interested in a fungal infection, it also allows us to understand all the other microbes that are in the oral cavity and, and, and leading into the, the gut. So we also are interested in the oral microbiome, which you, you may have heard of, of um, the microflora or all the microorganisms that, that are in the body, which outnumber actually human cells. So we, we also spend some time doing that because we study um, ways that the, the body no longer fights disease properly, some of these like radiotherapy and chemotherapy actually causes, causes damage to the oral, um, the oral cavity. So that allows us to study different damage and wound healing pathways. 
and then how all of this would relate to different cancer immunotherapies. So this, this here, I, it, A, is probably really small on your screen, so I don't necessarily expect you to see everything here, but this is kind of our world going from um, at the Conti Labs world, I should say, going from Canada albicans, the fungus, to how the different immune components, how you control the fungus in the oral cavity. So along the way, we are interested in first the cells that recognize candida and then the different proteins that these cells produce and then how those proteins induce the rest of the immune response or how we are going to fight that infection. And it, this can include different hosts. So either in, in humans, um, I should say adult humans or, or infants. And as you'll see in the next slide, we study this in a mouse model to understand um, the disease in a host. So then we, we try to understand the next layer of the immune response, how other immune cells are activated, what they start producing, and then how the oral cavity itself, the epithelium, your, the, the um, epithelial skin, the layers inside your oral cavity, how they then take part in protection against the fungus. So then we look at what they're producing um, that would call in other immune cells and even kill candida directly, all leading to fungal control, right? Which we, we um, want to understand because it happens in the background of, of so many conditions. So if, if you're in our lab, um, you will eventually learn our mouse model you'll um, start to understand what we do and how this system is a really good way to understand human health and disease. And essentially what we're doing is we induce the infection in, in mice to, to see what immune components oops, are induced, which ones are important. So we expose uh, the mouse to Canada, we give it Canada albicans, we induce oral candidiasis, and you can even see that it's quite faithful um, to the human condition. You can see the white patchy um, patches on the, the mouse's tongue. So that allows us to take mice that might be missing certain immune components and see how how they fight disease when they're missing those immune components. Right? So that's how we determine how susceptible they are. And we look at how much fungus is growing there on their tongue. Um, so then from that point forward, there's a lot of different assays um, that we do, different experiments that you can all be involved in. Um, first, we would be interested in you add, you add the fungus in there, what genes are activated. So we can do some transcriptional profiling. We do that either through real time or, or qPCR, um, which you may or may not have heard about. Um, we do some array based technology that's going to get into the bioinformatics. Um, so our, our undergrads can even become involved in, in bioinformatic um, projects as well. An important component in the oral cavity is saliva. It can um, actually, the components in saliva kill candida directly. So it, it bathes the oral cavity um, and, and it helps keep candida from overgrowing. So we might take saliva from different mice, from a normal mouse or a mouse that is missing an immune component and see if that kills candida or not. So that would be a candida killing assay. And then we can look at other proteins that are in the saliva, if they're there or not, and, and if they're playing a role in, in killing candida directly. And then 
as I mentioned, we're interested in the cells that are involved. So we, we look at the cellular response. And this is where I, I think um, where it really sets our department apart in that we have some really, really high tech equipment. We have a flow cytometer um, and, and various others, but I have a flow cytometer in my lab. And this is a machine that allows us to look at cells and look what's on their surface and understand how they would change during health or disease. And undergrads are able to use equipment like this in our lab um, and throughout the department, it's departmental. Um, and that's not something that you're going to get at, at other universities, right? That, that trust to let you use a, a quarter of a million dollar um, machine after proper training. Um, we also do a lot of histology. Um, I have a student who is graduating and she's going on to a pathology assistant program. And I, I, I would like to think that her love for that really came from her project in our lab, which was, was very pathological, very histological. And then we can do some other functional assays, seeing if those cells work. Then we're able to do other things to the mice. We can immunosuppress them in different ways. I mentioned the radiotherapy, and that's a big one of, of what we do in the lab and, and, and why it aligns so well with human health and disease, where we take mice and give them, expose them to radiation, like a patient would be receiving head, neck irradiation, and then see how that induces damage the immune response that's involved in that, the inflammation, and then how that relates to their susceptibility to fungal infection. And then another really cool thing that we can do in our lab in using this model is we are also are involved in antifungal drug development with a lab in the biochem department. And for this, we have undergrads um, even from the, the, the biochem lab, really spearheading all of the, the, um, the experiments where we can take the, the novel antifungal, mix it with candida and see if it kills candida. We're doing toxicity studies um, to see if it's tolerated in, in mice um, or if it's toxic to human cells in, in culture. And then we're able to take this antifungal drug and use it in our mouse model and see if it's effective in, in killing Canada and um, preventing the development of oral candidiasis. And I, I want to, I have these stars here. I, I can guarantee you every single one of these projects has the hands of an, of an undergrad on. Okay. So lastly, um, I think I probably had just a couple minutes left. Um, lastly, um, just want to, to throw out some pictures of the Conti lab. Um, we do need an update. Hopefully COVID will allow us to do that soon. Um, and put this up. This is just a, a quick list of, of the undergrads that have been in our lab um, starting in 2015 when I, when I came here through um, 2019. Um, so we, we really do have uh, um, a real commitment to, to having undergraduates in the lab. Um, and in that regard, if you're interested, maybe, um, here's one of our publications. Um, you can check it out. Um, and I highlighted, this was a previous one that we did have um, in red, that one undergrad. Um, at that point that's on it. Um, and then I mentioned some of the other publications that we have coming out with, with undergrads. And I probably went over, um, so I'll, I'll leave it to some questions. I don't know if Ryan wants to hold off till the end maybe, or? Yeah, so I think what we're gonna do is we'll, we'll pause on questions for now and kind of put okay. them at the end. So if you folks do have specific questions for Dr. Conti about the research that she's doing, her lab is doing, or, or anything that she kind of talked about, 
go ahead and save those questions just for another 15, 20 minutes, and then we will be able to cover all of those. But thank you so much, Dr. Conti, for giving us all that great information about what you folks are doing on campus and the way that these prospective students can get involved. Um, we are going to switch over a little bit to another area within the College of Natural Science and Mathematics. We're going to listen to a little bit of the research from Dr. William Hintz, uh, who works over more in the world of ecology, right? Ecology? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, communication degree. So not as good with all of the different fields of science, but Dr. Hintz, please take it away. All right. Um, I'll share my screen here. And if you don't see the slides, please just let me know. Okay. Um, let me minimize a couple things here. Okay, so uh, as Dr. Conti said, you know, uh, thank you for attending this session, and, and it's exciting that we have uh, so many participants uh, from different areas, and you know, the world is a, a little difficult right now, um, but you know, we'll get past this, and, and research is still happening, and research experiences on campus at the University of Toledo are still happening. So uh, there's a lot of, as you just saw, there's a lot of exciting research going on. Um, here at the University of, at, excuse me, at the University of Toledo. So I'm Bill Hintz. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Sciences, so a different department than Dr. Conti, uh, but we're in the same college of natural sciences and mathematics. And so my research, uh, my research lab is based out of the Lake Erie Center, which is actually located right on the lake. If I turn to my right, I'm basically stay, staring at Lake Erie. Um, outside my office window. So we aren't on main campus, but we are, um, you know, a, a branch of, of campus. And so when you arrive to campus, I would strongly encourage you to come visit the Lake Erie Center. There's a lot of great research going on out here. Um, and, and my lab in particular, what we focus on is freshwater ecology and conservation. Um, so I'd like to give you just a little bit of background about what we study and why we study it. Um, so as you all know, I mean, freshwater resources are, are critically important to our everyday lives. And, and you realize this by just turning on the faucet. Well, you want clean water coming out of your faucet, right? Um, the food on your table, if you eat fish, shellfish, or anything that comes you know, some comes from the ocean, but a lot of the food that we eat comes from the Great Lakes. Um, and then recreation opportunities. Maybe you enjoy visiting the beach, or maybe you're an angler, uh, like that's my sister's husband um, in the bottom there holding a giant muscle lunge. Uh, so freshwater resources provide, you know, they are critical to our well-being um, as humans, right? So, and, and a lot of different ways that they're critically important to our everyday life. Uh, so. One issue is, is that these resources that we value, you know, are under many, you know, under threat from a variety of different sources. There can be invasive species in an ecosystem. We can get different types of pollution or contaminants, nitrogen and phosphorus, for example. Um, things like road salts, which I'll discuss in a minute, uh, microplastics, and a whole host of other contaminants that that threaten those resources that we need every day. And then there's the issue of, of global climate change, right? That, that is affecting how our freshwater ecosystems, large lakes, small lakes, streams, wetlands, rivers, how they function. And, and it affects what we call the ecosystem services that those ecosystems provide. Those services are kind of some of those things that we enjoy that I, I, I illustrated on the previous slide. So our, re our research really focuses on how these threats affect freshwater organisms and the functioning of those ecosystems. And some of these, these threats that I've identified on the slide here, you know, it's not always just one threat. It's not always just two threats, but these things co-occur, right, in space and time. If you were to go to any lake ecosystem, for example, it might be contaminated with nutrients and salts and invasive species, and climate change might be altering 
ice cover, for example, on a lake or water temperature on a lake affecting the organisms in that lake ecosystem. So we, in addition to understanding how these threats um, affect freshwater ecosystems and the services they provide, um, we search for ways to fix these environmental problems. And, and we hope that our research is leveraged in a way that can create not only reactive environmental policies, but proactive environmental policies, as well as management actions to kind of remediate some of these issues that are afflicting freshwater ecosystems. Uh, one issue we've been studying for a while now um, are the impacts of road de-icing salts. These, you know, if you live in a cold region or where these salts are applied to the road, uh, you're probably very familiar with this. Um, these road salts are, are essential for human safety. They reduce accident rates by about 78 to 85%, right? So we need these salts for human safety, but there's an un unintended consequence of applying these salts to the road. That's when they wash off the roads into adjacent freshwater ecosystems, they increase the salinity of those ecosystems. Now, most freshwater organisms can only tolerate a certain range of salinity. So we are kind of by protecting everyone on the roads, your family, your friends, my family and friends, um, you know, there's this kind of unintended consequence that we're also um, contributing to the degradation of our water quality and, and negatively affecting some freshwater organisms. So the newsreels anyway, are, are kind of picking this up and, and across a bunch of different uh, news outlets, you can see that, that, that you know, this is kind of a, a growing threat to our freshwater resources. So one of the major questions that not only me and my graduate students, but a lot of our undergrads, as, as Elena will discuss in a little bit, focus on is what are those impacts on freshwater ecosystems? Now, if you just look at this picture here, um, everything is interconnected. You know, if you hunt, fish, whatever, um, just enjoy the outdoors, you know, everything on the land and the water, they're all interconnected. And this is a concept I teach in my I teach ecology, right? Um, and so we always talk about interconnectedness, that if we change one thing, let's say in a freshwater lake or a river, something else down the line, like a domino effect will occur and something else down the line will also change. So this is kind of what we focus on um, with regard to this research um, branch in, our, in, my, in my research lab. So, you know, how do we study this? Right, I mean, road salt pollution has been occurring for decades um, and we need to understand how it's affecting these freshwater systems. One way of understanding how freshwater ecosystems are affected by uh, road salts is to um, use what are called mesocosms. So what you see here, if the animation is working correctly, are 350 gallon tanks. And in each one of those tanks, if you look on the right, we, we populate it with an experimental food web. So we collect organisms from the environment and we try to replicate as much as possible, um, you know, a natural food web. So we take representative organisms and you can see that on this food web on the right, we, we include everything from algae to fish um, in those mesocosms. So, you know, this is, and then what we do is we, we can set a certain concentration of salt in those different mesocosms, or we can add nutrients, we can add pesticides or something like that. So we can really understand, we can change the temperature as well. So we can look at a broad multifaceted approach um, to understanding how organisms in the environment might respond to all those threats that I was talking about before. Um, these are really fun to use, this facility. This isn't the Lake Erie Center, but we're setting this up uh, just out back of the Lake Erie Center now. Um, and so that's, that's kind of one way we determine how a lot of those threats and road salts, and, and road salts included uh, could potentially affect freshwater organisms and ecosystems. So just to, I, I won't bore you with a ton of results, um, graphs and figures and stuff like that, but a few 
things we've discovered is that if you look at the top, right, this is just a, a, a rainbow trout. And so a baby rainbow trout there on the left. And after about 25 days, you can see how the, the trout have developed, right? Kind of look more like fish. Um, but when we have that bottom fish in no road salt and we put these fish in high road salt, you can see a substantial reduction in growth. OK, that could potentially have long lasting effects throughout that fish's lifetime. And in, in if we were to model this out to the population level, we could potentially see a reduction in what we call uh, production. So fewer fish, smaller fish, um, a changing fishery, if you will. And, and that could occur for species that we enjoy eating um, on the bottom. One common theme that we found in our research is that we get less zooplankton and more algae. So, so what are zooplankton? I mean, these are just pelagic critters or critters in the water column of lakes and ponds and things like that. And almost every fish species, when it's first born, eats those plankton, okay? So those plankton, those zooplankton are critically important, not only for consuming algae and keeping the water column, keeping algae from essentially taking over, but those, they, they feed other organisms in the ecosystem. So they pr provide a variety of what we call functions in freshwater ecosystems. And what we're finding as, as we salinize or as, we, as all these salts keep pouring into freshwaters, uh, we're really changing how these ecosystems look and, and, and what species are present and the growth of species, the survival of different species, so on and so forth. Um, so that's, that's just one area of research. Another area of research we focus on is, is restoring large river ecosystems, uh, specifically the Maumee River, which runs through the middle of Toledo, uh, the Toledo metropolitan area. Uh, the goal of this project is to kind of protect and restore habitat to facilitate the recovery of, of fish and invertebrates in that river ecosystem. So the Maumee River and rivers globally have, have been affected by humans quite a bit. Uh, we put in levee systems, we put in dams, we modify habitat, pollution gets into these rivers, so on and so forth. So we have what are called um, areas of concern. And so these are areas that have undergone pretty intense degradation, uh, but there's a huge effort uh, by a bunch of different agencies led by the United States Environmental Protection uh, Agency um, that are trying to rehabilitate these Ecosystem. So we are playing, we are trying to play a small role in, in facilitating the recovery of these areas of concern. And so we go out on the river, we sample fish and invertebrates with a variety of different methods. Um, and then we make recommendations um, to restore habitat in those ecosystems. And we work with a wide, wide variety of collaborators, one being the United States uh, geological survey, and we even worked with another university just south of here, Bowling Green State University, on this project. So, um, yeah, we're trying to just, you know, bring these rivers back um, to some desirable, you know, state where the ecosystem can kind of, you know, get healthy, if you will. Um, Another project that we are working on is the reintroduction of the iconic lake sturgeon. So, if you're familiar with you know, the Great Lakes region, um, probably one of the most iconic species in the Great Lakes is the lake sturgeon. And you see that picture here. So what we're trying to do, I mentioned we're trying to rehabilitate river systems um, in, on the previous slide, but we're also trying to reintroduce species that are no longer in those river systems because of historical degradation that has occurred. So our goal is to reintroduce self-sustaining populations of the lake sturgeon into the Maumee River. And um, we might be moving to do the same in other river systems like that Cuyahoga River uh, over towards Cleveland um, and other river systems throughout the Great Lakes. Uh, our, our collaborators on this project are the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. You can see uh, Justin Shyot pictured there is one of our collaborators from uh, a US federal government agency. And the geological survey, we work with the state of Ohio, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, Michigan State University on this project and the Toledo Zoo. So if you are 
you know, if you're enrolled or thinking about enrolling at the University of Toledo, make sure you hit up the Toledo Zoo. It's a really fascinating place. But they are one of our collaborators as well um, on this project to reintroduce Lake Sturgeon. Um, undergraduate involvement, I, I mean, I could not do my research without undergraduates. Um, this is just a photo of of past undergraduates that have worked with me on some of the research I just described. Um, we'll, we'll, Elena will speak in a moment, but um, you know, there's everything from processing samples in the lab, like in that picture in the top middle, to um, top right. Those are two undergrads, electrofishing. So electrofishing is one way we sample fish in the environment. We put an electric current in the water and basically it temporarily stuns the fish. So you can net them, you can weigh them, measure them. And then after they've recovered, we put them back in the water. Um, and two of my undergrads in the bottom, bottom right here, um, they're, they're picking zooplank um, out of cups. And so we did a road salt experiment here last, uh, in November and December last semester that uh, Elena was involved in and, and three other undergraduates. So a lot of undergraduate involvement in the lab. And, and um, you know, Miss Elena Carson, who's, who's with us today, she's been uh, with the lab for four semesters now. Uh, she typically has taken directed research credit. So you can earn credit, you can get paid, um, you know, maybe in the summer times, um, and, and you can get a variety of experiences in the lab from, from field work to laboratory experience. And we do a lot of professional development workshops to ensure that, you know, once you get your degree, what do you do with it, right? There's a lot of ways that uh, we work with undergrads in our lab to enhance their ability to get to the top of applicant pools when they leave U Toledo and start applying for jobs. So um, with that, um, I'll turn it over briefly to Elena. And if Elena, you would like to uh, just talk, you know, it's, it's not on me to talk about the undergraduate's experience. I think it's best, it's also good to hear from them. So um, Elena, would you like to say a few words? Sure, thanks for that introduction. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Elena Carson. I'm currently a senior at UT. I've got a major in environmental sciences, a concentration in biology, and then a minor in sustainability. So I know that's kind of like a lot going on you can definitely figure that stuff out over the years. I know I have, you don't have to know all that going straight in, which I think is like something really great is that you don't have to know exactly what you wanna do going into this. I'm sure a lot of you guys have general ideas, but I think directed research is a really great way to explore the ideas you have and see what you do and don't wanna do. Um, I've kind of done a whole lot these past four years that I've been here. Uh, a lot of it has been with directed research, which I really enjoyed. Um, I've worked with Dr. Hintz, especially on um, the saltwater project or road salts project. Um, as he mentioned, I was like the little blonde in that corner um, processing the Daphnia samples. So um, kind of just get into a little bit more of like what we would do in the lab. Um, we got to do a whole bunch of different things. And I thought kind of the coolest part is I got to be there every step of the way for the experiments. I got to go out and collect field samples, um, do excursions out on the Mommy Bay, which is a river in Toledo, um, and like pick up samples. Um, we do like net dredging and stuff like that. And then it was really cool because we got to take those samples and I got to go back and process them in the lab. So it was real time taking what we've done and then going and processing it and seeing the results. So that was always really cool. Um, doing like arthropod sampling, really tiny stuff, really cool. Um, and then also just like designing experiments. So that was one of the past ones. Um, moving forward into the saltwater experiment, um, road salt experiment. Uh, I was um, there when we first started it and um, we designed the experiment, which seems like a really daunting process, but getting to be there and laying everything out, it's actually very logical, which I had no idea. In high school, I didn't really have many um, research opportunities. I just kind of took what I could. So being able to finally be in an official lab and see what it's like to create these experiments really gives you some insight into how you can create your future experiments for yourself and personal projects. So that was really cool. Um, and then learning general lab etiquette, it's very different every lab you go to. Um, each one will have different rules. So it's really good to be exposed to different labs and see um, how, how processing happens, things like that. Um, 
Dr. Hens also mentioned, so last year our um, semester was kind of affected by COVID. So we got to do a lot more of those developmental um, workshops, working on like resumes and cover letters, which was really awesome for me as a senior, being able to go out and get real input from my professors and other graduate students on what those documents should look like and what um, jobs we'll be looking for on those. Um, we also discussed a lot of different scientific papers, and I thought that was a lot of fun because in your classes, your professors pick out papers for you, and it's kind of about what they want to know. When you're in directed research, you kind of pick the topics that you want to work on, and you pick the things that are interested and tailored towards you. So being able to have these really great brainstorming sessions and discussions on these papers, it's all about the topics you're interested in. So it can really help you hone in on what skills and what um, topics you want to focus on in the future. Um, so it's been a really awesome time in the lab. I've enjoyed every second of it. I've gotten to do so many different things, um, especially at the Lake Erie Center. So um, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, but I also did wanna mention that you don't have to just work on a research lab to get um, research experience. Um, I'm the co-president of an organization on campus called Building Ohio's Sustainable Energy Future, which is focused on like sustainability efforts and um, Within that group, we have uh, smaller groups and each group takes on their own research project centered around whatever topics they find interesting based on like sustainability um, stuff. But so that's um, another great way is if you can't find a lab that does exactly what you want or you wanna try something on the small scale, there are organizations on campus that you can join where it's your peers creating these projects and working on them together. And I think that was a really great way for me to learn too, how to do things independently on your own, how to work in a group, and um, trying new projects, new ideas, new things. Um, and usually with like different organizations on campus, you also get other opportunities to present posters, um, practice presentations, lectures, things like that. So working in the research lab has definitely helped me a lot, um, but there are other opportunities on campus too, if you're interested. And yeah. Great, thank you, Elena. So that's it for me, Ryan, if you're happy to answer any questions. Yes, awesome. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I know that we're in a Zoom chat, but if everyone could please pretend to give a round of applause for all of our presenters, I would appreciate it. They'd appreciate it emotionally, I'm sure. Like I said before, I like, yeah, round of applause. Um, like I said before, we do have students and faculty here. Um, so please, please get those questions ready. Before we jump into the larger Q&A, I just want to, of course, give a shout out um, to those next steps that our students can actually take. So obviously, we're still a couple months away from you all starting your college careers. You still have graduate graduation from high school coming up, make sure you celebrate that because you, it is a big achievement. It's exciting. It's a milestone. Um, so don't skip over that to get to your college career too quickly. But as far as preparing for those next steps, if anyone out there is interested in what they can do, I'm going to post a video in the chat. Um, it is our next steps video. So it explains how to activate your MyUT account, how to put down your enrollment and housing deposit, signing up for orientation, uh, going and doing your housing application. If you're going to be living on campus, all that stuff is kind of folded into that video. Now, I will admit right away that video is uh, me. So if you're like, wow, I've had enough Ryan that I can handle, here is a link also to where you can find your admissions counselor, because just like me and my nine colleagues, we're all happy to walk you through. And you do have a counselor assigned to you. I'm sure at this point, you've probably gotten emails or calls or texts from them. So you probably know who they are. But if you don't, you can find that person right down there and we can all walk you through. So take those next steps when you're ready to becoming a rocket, put down your enrollment deposit, sign up for orientation orientation, all that fun stuff before we get to the day where you jump into these labs. Um, with all that being said, we're going to go ahead and open up to our larger Q&A. So we, like I said, have students, have faculty, whatever kind of questions you might have, we are here to answer them. Please just go ahead and put them in the chat and I will read through them one at a time so we can cover everything. Um, you can send them to everyone, which means posting it uh, to everyone in the Zoom chat, or if you want to ask a question anonymously, you can also send it directly to me and then I will be more than happy to ask it on your behalf. So you don't have to, you know, uh, put it out there for everybody to see. So with that being said, while we're waiting for the first questions to come in, I know we have a couple other students here tonight who haven't had the chance to introduce themselves. So if everyone who hasn't had the chance yet wants to just give a shout out who you are, what you're studying, all that fun stuff, uh, and then we can get rolling with the questions. Uh, 
All right, well, I'll go. Um, hi, my name is Andrea Pearsall. I am a senior, so I will be graduating this spring, and I am in Dr. Conti's lab. So I actually have two different labs that I had experience in. I started out in a neuroscience lab, which had nothing to do with what I was doing, but I love the research. Um, so, you know, you might have a major and you think you want to follow it, but if you find that someone else's research really intrigues you, you can always just step in and ask if you can be in that lab. And I really enjoy doing neuroscience, um, particularly working with live animals. Um, so once that lab moved, I, um, went to Dr. Conti and asked her if I could be in her lab because I loved working with the mice. I thought that that made the research so much more exciting. And I didn't know anything about immunology when I started, um, but I know a ton of more now, hopefully. <laughs> um, so yeah, you can start somewhere and end somewhere completely different. But um, I'm finishing up my honors thesis and I'm excited to have research in my back pocket for my resume and it's a really great experience. So I highly encourage you guys go for it. Okay, I can go next. Uh, my name is Lana. Um, I'm also on Dr. Heather Conti's lab. Um, I'm majoring in biology with a minor in chemistry um, on the pre-physician assistant track. And um, I actually was a part of Heather's lab since the start of my freshman year. So I was, I was actually uh, blessed to have that opportunity. And um, I can say that it's definitely been um, a rewarding experience for me, um, a humbling experience. Like Andrea said, I knew nothing about immunology when I started, but now I know much more. I still haven't taken the course, so I'm pretty sure I'll learn way more as I go along. But um, it definitely research is definitely an opportunity um, that I highly encourage every person to to, to do um, if they have the chance to, especially starting as a freshman, you know, you, you'll be able to experience various different types of um, uh, uh, caveats when it comes to research and um, strengthen your uh, time management, um, learning uh, responsibility, um, and just also be becoming a competitive applicant when it comes to uh, professional school. So um, it's definitely allowed me to learn uh, beyond the classroom experience. Um, uh, and I'm truly thankful for it. Awesome. Well, we're so happy to have both of you here. And we've had a couple of questions come in. So like I said, we'll take them one at a time. So don't worry, I will get to everyone's questions if you send them to me. The first question, uh, Andre, I think is in reference to something you said. Someone asked, what is an honors thesis? And do you only have to do it if you're an honors student? So an honors thesis, also known as a capstone project, is um, kind of like a final project that you do, it kind of sums up all your research experience that you've had um, in your undergraduate ex like career. So um, you don't have to do an honors thesis if you're not an honors student, but it's important to have a project that you focus on because um, I think that it really brings you more in depth into the lab that you're working in. Um, but if you are an honors student, you are required to do the capstone project in order to get your large honors medallion um, when you graduate. <laughs> I cannot wait to wear mine. Um, but yeah, so it's important to do a project um, that interests you and you can talk with your PI about what you wanna work on, uh, what you like to get involved in, so yeah. And you have to have it done by the time you graduate, but when did you start working on your honors project? Um, I had two choices. So when I was in the neuroscience lab, I did do an honors project for that, but I felt like I wanted something more in depth. So when I went to Conti's lab, I requested to do a capstone project for her lab. And so I started that, I started mine a little later because we had some trouble with our mice when we were breeding them, but we still got everything done in time. So I started that probably the beginning of the winter and I'm finishing it up now. Ryan, can I chime in? So I, I think that's, that's also a little bit of a misconception. So honor students have this honors thesis that they submit at the end and um, 
I, I think, and, and it might be how it's sold by the honors college. I'm not positive, but right. Sure. Like in, in Andrea's case, she did the project in a short amount of time, but you know, if I have an honor student that comes into my lab as a freshman, they're working on their honors project throughout, right? It's a, it's a thesis. Um, and, and then you would write it up in your last semester, but you're doing the research throughout your time there. I think there's some leeway in, in case you don't enter a lab early enough, right? That, that you could do it in a short amount of time. Like Andrea, we were fortunate enough to get her when another PI left the university. Um, and we kind of had to scramble a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, it, it's more, you do your research for four years and then you, you know, you write up the thesis at the end, like you would for a master's or, or anything. Awesome. Thank you. That is, that is perfect. And for anyone out there curious, you know, if you applied originally to the university as an honors student, you know, you should have already gotten back your decision, but you can also apply to the honors college as a current student. So after your freshman year gets going, you can of course still apply to the honors college and be a part of that program. Um, a question I get a lot from students, um, and I think it's important to throw this out there, you are also not bound to the honors program. Um, you don't have to do it all the way to graduation. So don't think that if you don't finish your honors, uh, program that you can't finish your degree at the university and that you can't finish your degree with a great experience along the way. So just know that there is, you know, there's no binding you to it all the way through your college career. So don't let that be another thing that you, you kind of hold yourself to internally. Yeah, Dr. Conti. And also I, I mentioned it, in no way do you have to be an honor student to do research. On the publication that we're trying to put out, I think there's like four undergrads. I mean, one is not an honor student, you know, by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> um, so I, I just, I think it, um, yeah, please don't think you have to be an honor student to do research and to do research for four years and, and have a, a, a very full research experience. So that's also sometimes some confusion. Mm -hmm. well, please go ahead. So um, just to add on, um, I know I mentioned it, but I had the opportunity to do, um, like I said, I'm, I started with Heather in freshman year, and I had the opportunity to participate in the first year um, summer research symposium um, program. And um, how that works is, I'm pretty sure um, Heather mentioned it, but you get paid to do research over the summer, you have a project, and at the end, you're able to um, present that project um, at a, a, a undergraduate research like symposium fair in front of like faculty and other students. So, and we, we have uh, Pfizer and we have user cap. So Pfizer is only open to freshman students. So that's a great opportunity uh, for our freshman students that are interested. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so I've had a lot of questions come in between the beginning of that question and the end of the end of it. So um, just to respect everyone's time here in the panel, um, we're going to try and answer these next ones a little quicker just to make sure we get everybody out of here at a, at a reasonable time. Because again, I know everybody has other Thursday evening plans, but we will go through our, the best that we can all these questions. So the next one um, is, I guess I should rephrase a little bit. Uh, can you join any lab, even if it's in a different department? Yes. So, so the short answer is yes, absolutely. I, I know just from my standpoint, I had students from um, Health and Human Services, um, in different colleges. I know that um, there are faculty in environmental sciences that take um, bio students um, as well. So yeah, absolutely. Now there is some, you have to kind of check the rules if you are an honor student. Like I had a student from chemistry and biochem doing her honors project with me, but then found out a year in that that department doesn't allow an honors project in a different department. So yeah, I'm, you absolutely can, short answer, but yeah, just you have to make sure if you're an honors student. But I had an honors student from another department in my lab and that was fine, but, but not that department. Yeah, and in, in environmental sciences, we have students from environmental engineering quite often. Um, yes. Every semester, I've had students from environmental engineering. Um, mm -hmm. So, so yeah, it's quite possible. Awesome. Uh, is there any specific type of research that you easily lose track of time? So maybe that you do it and you lose track of time as you're doing the research? 
So you mean like when we were talking about our research and we could go on forever, <laughs> which I think was my case. <laughs> I, I guess I'm not quite sure how to answer that one. Yeah. I don't know exactly what, what they're looking for. I'm terrible at keeping you track lose of yourself in the first research. Place. But yeah, once you get me started on research, I'll keep talking about it. And uh, there's always multiple projects. Sometimes we have to when you start a project, you need to finish it, right? There's this timeline where you want to be productive and make sure you finish what you started. But in science, there are so many questions. And when you answer one question, you answer a ton of other questions or, or a ton of other questions come up. So um, regarding the timeline of science or time in general, yeah, it's, I lose track of time and projects when you have so many going on at the same time, um, but it's really fun. It's really fun to do, so. Awesome. And for the person who asked that question, if that isn't exactly what you meant, feel free to send me another message and clarifying and, and I will totally ask it in a rephrased way. Um, but so we have another question here. Um, uh, are, are most students who take part in research part of the Jester Scott Honors College or can research be conducted outside the college? Um, I guess we've already answered that question, but here's the last part. Is the Honors College worth joining? I'm seeing some head nods. <laughs> I guess I'm an ex honors college student. So I definitely think I would have loved to stay in it if it had worked with my schedules. It just kind of didn't happen that way. I definitely think it's a good thing to try out if you can at first. There were a lot of experiences my freshman year. Um, you can like adapt normal classes to be an honors class and your professor will kind of just give you some extra things to do to really like advance your learning. And if I hadn't done that, like there were a lot of just like smaller opportunities I would have missed out on. Like I got to go to Dayton one time for this huge conference and network with a whole bunch of people. And so now I'm not really an honor student anymore. Didn't really work out, but I still got a lot of experience from that that I think was really valuable. And you get to register early. So that's never a bad thing, especially when you're a freshman, you'll want that. Oh, please go ahead. All right. Um, so I stayed in the Honors College, and I think it's a great um, opportunity if it works for you, um, especially once you get past the basic classes that they do require you to take. Um, they're more philosophy classes, but they really broaden your perspective. Um, but you also get access to classes that nobody else gets to take in the university. So like last semester, I got to take a stand up comedy class, and that's only for honor students. So just saying. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's awesome. That's really cool. Um, hey, Ryan, I'll just pop in. This is Gail. I know um, registration for the Honors College is available up until pretty much uh, fall semester is going to start. So I'm going to pop that link into the chat section where you can go to the Honors College webpage. And as was mentioned, they do have a lot of great things that aren't available to other students and that the travels they do are just amazing. So if you're interested in it, it really is something worth checking out. So I'll pop that link in there. I just wanted to add that real quick. I also want to mention that even though I think it's important for all students to have exposure to research, there are some faculty out there that will only take honor students, right? They, they do value I guess they just think that they have a little bit higher level of commitment because they do have to do that project at the end. Um, so, you know, it, it may help you finding a research position as well, maybe. Awesome. And this next question kind of leads into it. Um, so could you write an honors thesis for every research lab that you're a part of? Or maybe it's any research lab that you're a part of. seeing some no's. No, no, you would, you would, you would write your, like Andrea said, right? It's a capstone. It's, um, you know, kind of a culmination of the, the main body of work that you did during your honors. So, I mean, that's, that's a technical question for the honors college, but, but my guess would be, and it's probably not even a guess, would be no, um, because you don't take, research for honors credit until your senior year anyway. The biology 4910 that I was talking about, you take two honors semesters of that in your senior year. 
and you can take non-honors as much as you want. So, but these are probably better questions for the honors college. <laughs> so I was just about to say, I'm getting a lot of honors yeah. questions, which is awesome. It makes sense that, that you'd have a lot of questions about that stuff. And I want to throw it out there mm -hmm. because they are actually doing a webinar series of their own. And their next webinar is on April 6th. I just took a look. Um, I posted the registration link down there. If you want to go hang out with them, we'll answer, the, we'll keep answering questions, but you know, I would recommend really Josh Martin from the Honors College, um, Dean Apple, uh, who is the Dean of the Honors College, um, Justin C, who is the admissions counselor that works the Honors Program. They do some really cool stuff with the Honors students, the prospective Honors students. This is a great place to get those questions answered as well. Um, this next question, not Honors related, and I think um, I'll say something about this real quick before I open up for other answers, but um, how hard a time did how hard a time did you all have making friends in and out of the program? And the first thing I want to throw out there is that every student that you meet opening weekend or in the first semester is nervous about meeting people. So some people are better at hiding it and they're better at playing it cool, but everyone is anxious when they first go to college. So don't feel like you're the only person that's experiencing this, that you're not making friends fast enough, that you don't fit in. First semester is really hard. You're, you're learning something brand new, which is being a college student. It's a skill that you have to kind of practice. So don't think anybody is, is just crushing it. Um, you, you have your own timeline to live on. So um, I, I've said my piece. I'll open it up to everyone else in the panel, you know, about making friends and connections that first semester, especially. Lingo. Um. I think the first week I moved in, I was kind of sitting by myself in my room a lot, and that's pretty normal. Everybody will kind of do that. Um, COVID makes it a little bit different, but pretty much there's always activities going on campus, always ways for you to meet new people. And I know like in the environmental science department, there's like 60 of us in total. So pretty much every class, once it got to like a smaller manageable size, not chemistry where there's 500 people, but your normal like general classes, you'll get come to recognize everyone. You'll sit behind the same people. You'll ask them for homework help, things like that. So it definitely becomes a lot easier once you kind of recognize your peers. And yeah, exactly like Ryan said, like everyone's looking for friends. And that's kind of like the best part about college is just going out and trying different things, meeting people in your classes, meeting them in different student organizations, things like that. So that's why when the person asks if they want to do a research, like a thesis for every project they do, don't forget that you want to have time to be a college student. This is your time to make these connections professionally and socially, just like friendships. So um, it'll come easy to you, I promise. Wanna go ahead. Yeah, um, so I completely agree with um, Elena's statement, but for me, what made it easier for me is I was, I'm definitely an introverted person. <laughs> I'm very shy. Um, so coming into college, um, what I did to help me make new friends and make connections, um, both professionally and socially, is I joined a lot of um, organizations on campus. And that's how I got to link with people and learn about other professions as well. Um, you know, I got involved in research. I previously was a pre-med student. I learned about the pre-PA profession. So that's how I got into the pre-PA profession and learned more about that. So definitely um, joining organizations and whether it has to do with your major or not, that's um, one way that helped me um, get to know more people, so. Awesome, thank you all so much. Um, another question that came in, and I'm gonna keep this one pretty short because we talked about it a lot in our first webinar series. So if you wanna check out the highlights from that one, it's definitely in there. Um, but how difficult is it for incoming freshmen to get involved with research? And is it possible to start researching the summer before you enter the University of Toledo? So the summer leading into that freshman year. So I know the short answer for, can you get involved as a freshman during your freshman year, yes, you can. And like I said, I'll reference that first webinar we did because there's a great explanation in it that we just don't have time for tonight. But could a prospective student do research the summer leading into it if they're taking summer courses? So I would say under normal circumstances, probably, right? There, there may be, especially if you're local. This summer, probably not. Right. I'm still trying to to maintain all my personnel and, and keep everyone socially distanced. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be tough this summer. And that's it's, I think. it's possible there are some internships available too. like our, our research crews are pretty large in the summertime during non-COVID times. I would say that it's 
it would be much easier to, mm -hmm. you'll see these posted kind of all over the place locally at the university, but um, there are opportunities. It's once we get past COVID, that'll pick back up. So you might not be able to do it this summer leading into your freshman year, but the summer after your freshman yeah. year leading into sophomore year and, sure. and all the summers yeah. after you would definitely be involved. Um, question about applying still for the honors college. Uh, someone recently took a trip to campus. So, you know, could they still apply? Um, reach out to me directly and I can certainly help you with the honors application. Um, I believe Josh Martin informed me they're still reviewing them. So we can talk about your possible path into it as an incoming student. But again, you can always apply as a current student. I think up until the end of your sophomore year, they still review applicants for the honors college. So we can certainly chat. Just go ahead and, and you know, email me directly, text me directly. Um, and then we can certainly chat about that. Um, how does taking an, a non-honors course as an honors student work? Do all of your classes have to be honors? And the answer to that is no, because only some of the classes are honors, but there are other regular courses during your undergraduate career that you'll take that are not technically honors, but um, are still part of your degree program. If anyone wants to add anything to that, I think that's kind of the, the short answer. Um, so you don't have to take like all your classes as honors. You can pick and choose. Um, each professor requires different things to be done in order to get that honors credit. Um, so I guess it just kind of depends on the class and who's teaching it. Awesome. And that's another thing, you know, I'll throw out there too for, for everybody um, as we kind of wrap up here is, uh, like I said earlier, you know, a lot of you have never been to college before. And I, I would venture to say most everyone who's here today, not as a current student or faculty member, has probably never been to college. So these are the kind of things that it's totally fine to ask, you know, reach out, send us emails. Um, we are happy to help kind of guide you through that beginning, whether it's your upperclassmen students, like you see here in the chat, if it's your professors, your advisors, your success coach. Um, I can't tell you how long into my college career it took me before I finally asked someone what a credit hour was. I was not a freshman and I wasn't a sophomore and it doesn't matter, but you can ask those questions early in your career and people understand that you might not know the answers. That's all totally fine. We've gone 15 minutes past when we were supposed to stop. So I want to give a big thank you to everyone today um, who was here with us in the chat, uh, who presented, who, who gave us their perspectives, who gave us their experiences on campus and all the students who have stuck around to, to hear these great answers from all of our current students. Um, that is where we're going to wrap it up. If anyone has any additional questions, please feel free to reach out. Hopefully we see you all on campus soon. Make sure you head to the website, utilita.edu. Click visit up there at the top and come see us. Experience Day is coming up on April 17th, but there are also regular campus visits happening most days of the week. So you can come and check us out. But with that being said, everyone enjoy the rest of your Thursday evening. Have a great April and we will hopefully see you on campus soon. <laughs>